the privilege to work with Glenn for the last five years. Glenn actually completed his schooling in Trinidad and did residency at New York State University. Then he was awarded NIDDK fellowship at NIH for three years. While being at NIH, he did extensive research on viral kinetics and management of NASH. Following that, uh, Glenn got attracted to California and has been seduced by it since then. He completed his residence, he completed his fellowship and transplant fellowship both at UCSF and we have been lucky that Glenn has been with us since then. He has been, uh, he had several publications, has been speaker at various national and international levels and we are very happy that Glenn is with us today to give us a talk on updates on liver transplantation. Uh, welcome Glenn. Thank you, Radhika. Um, so, um, in the world of liver transplantation, there's two big things that um, are affecting the world of liver transplant. One is organ allocation, and the other is outcomes after transplantation. Um, at the liver meeting this year, there's not a lot about organ allocation, mainly because the organ allocation system, and if you're aware, is undergoing go a radical change, supposedly starting January 1st. Um, there's not gonna be any geographic boundaries anymore for liver transplantation in terms of where organs get distributed to, and this was based on a, a lawsuit that someone filed against UNOS. So at next year at this meeting, I'm gonna talk about what the, um, the landscape looks like in terms of organ allocation. But what I wanna focus a lot about is the shortage of donor organs we have right now. And as a result, when patients actually get referred to us for liver transplantation, and a lot of you do refer patients to us, um, unfortunately, sometimes patients die on the wait list, primarily because we just don't have organs for them. Um, in the United Kingdom, it's been estimated that about 37% of the organs on offer get discarded, as the surgeons say it ends up in the garbage. Um, and a lot of the reasons why is because these livers are felt to be suboptimal at the time of retrieval. And there's a group actually from the United Kingdom and Europe in general, it's called COPE, the Consortium for Organ um, Preservation Europe. And they've actually been working on ways to actually um, use some of these livers that actually have been discarded. So suboptimal livers um, that they actually do go to retrieve don't tolerate well and there's a high discard rate. When they go to pick up these organs, basically when they flush the organ, they put it in a bag, they put some solution in it, they put it into another bag, and they put it on ice. And that brings down the temperature of the organ. When you bring down the temperature of the organ, the metabolism of the organ slows down, and so the production of reactive oxygen, speci oxygen species decreases. But at the same time, generation of ATP actually decreases. And all of this goes on is to damage, it damages the organ. And so when they put the organ back into the patient and they perfuse the organ, sometimes the organ um, does not function very well. One of the other problems about cooling the liver is that you can't tell if the liver is working well before you put it into a patient because the metabolic rate of the liver is actually lower now. So there's no way to functionally assess the liver just before you put it in. And these issues in terms of cold storage of organs are even higher problem when we use donor after cardiac death livers, that is organs that are procured after the heart stops beating, or fatty livers, because <clears throat> these livers are suboptimal to begin with, and this situation just gets worse when you put it in cold storage. So a method of keeping the donor liver in a physiologic state, avoiding cooling, and which allows for recovery and functional testing is needed. So for several years now, when you go to the liver meeting, there's this group out of Europe, and what they've been developing, and this is mainly at Oxford University, is a machine um, to do something called normothermic machine perfusion. So this basically is a machine that is portable, and what they do is when they go to procure the organs, they can actually remove the organ from the body, cannulate it on the back table, and they hook it up to this machine. And what this machine does, it perfuses three liters of blood through the, um, through the, uh, through the liver, um, and they can actually um, control the pressure at which the blood is flowing through the liver. They can assess the flow rate of blood through the liver. They can actually feed the liver. They can actually test uh, the glucose level in the blood, and they can actually give the liver TPN, um, basically life support for a liver, until they get it back to the center where they're going to um, 
in plan deliver. And so this here is the setup um, that they use, and this is a cannulated liver. <coughs> now, I don't really read the journal Nature much because it's a little bit um, difficult for me to read. <laughs> but the few times I've read it, I've never seen a randomized controlled trial published in Nature. This is the first time I've ever seen it. I don't know if anybody's ever seen one before. But this was published in April of this year, and it's a randomized trial of normotomic preservation in liver transplantation. And it's the same group. And what they did, if you look there, you can see they randomized patients, well, sorry, they randomized livers that were going to go to patients um, to either normotomic machine perfusion versus SCS, which is standard cold storage. And eventually, they implanted 121 uh, livers into the NMP group and 101 into the uh, standard cold storage group. Now, if you look at, just look at this diagram for a minute, you'll see actually 16 livers were discarded in the NMP group and 32 in the um, standard cold storage group. So immediately, what it, they, they noticed is that at the time that they brought the livers back and they were ready to implant them, they found that there, are certain, there was a twice number of livers that were discarded in the standard cold storage group compared to the um, NMP group. And that's just based on what the surgeon thought, like how the liver looked, the color of the liver, um, how the tissue felt. Thing. And then they analyzed the primary outcome in terms of how did the livers perform afterwards. So in overall, they did 220 liver transplants and they compared cold static storage to normotopic in um, perfusion. And they found, based on AST and ALT levels, that there's a 50% lower level of graft injury in the ones that got NMP. And this was despite a 50% lower rate of organ discard and a 54% longer mean preservation. So it obviously it takes longer to cannulate that liver the way that they do it there. And that's why it takes longer to put the liver in compared to standard cold storage. But still, when they looked at it, these livers had less graft injury. And when they looked at the outcomes in terms of patient and graft survival, which were actually relatively short, they found no significant difference in terms of NMP versus um, standard cold storage. And the graph there, basically the plot actually shows you in terms of looking at AST as a marker of liver injury, that NMP actually caused less uh, liver injury in these organs. And it's a very, very nice paper to read because as I said, it's easy to read. But the nice part about the discussion is they talk about the fact that, yes, so this is equivalent or probably better than standard cold storage, but they hint in the discussion that they may be able to use these machines to actually resuscitate bad livers and actually test the liver before it's put into the patient to see if it'll perform well. And in addition, in that, in that discussion, they talk about the possibility of using these perfusion machines to actually remove fat from the livers. And the first two talks at the liver meeting this year, abstracts one and two, were addressing from the same group both of these issues, and that's what I'm gonna show you. <clears throat> so the first abstract, transplantation of discarded livers after viability testing with normothermic machine perfusion, the vital trial. And so basically they said livers from high-risk donors are frequently rejected, and this compromises the only increasing and underutilized donor resource. So the aim of their study was to see whether normotomic machine perfusion can provide an objective assessment of discarded marginal livers to achieve successful transplant, and two, to enable, they set a standard of they want to enable at least salvaging 50% of the livers that they tested. Now, this problem actually, you can actually see in terms of utilization of organs. You can see the transplant volume as in um, green, in that line there, this is the United States. But if you look at the, the number of patients that are actually, the livers that are discarded, it's actually gone up and it's actually been pretty stable. So the patients are not getting transplanted as much because they're not getting waitlist removed and we're actually continuing not to use these organs. So hopefully with this sort of technology, they'll be able to use more organs and that's what they're trying to demonstrate. <coughs> so when, they, when a liver was discarded, in the um, United Kingdom <clears throat> um, at one of the centers where they went out to, to get the liver and they felt that the liver wasn't useful, they actually would fly the liver back to one of the centers where they had the machine and they would hook the machine up to the liver and actually um, perform resuscitation on the liver and then test the liver to see if they could use the liver. Now, 
in the transplant world, there are certain types of livers that when you hear certain things about the liver, you don't want. And these are as follows. This is the kind of liver you don't want. One with a donor risk index greater than two, biopsy proven macrosteatosis, transamnase is more than 1,000, a warm ischemia, in ischemia time more than 30 minutes in a DCD liver, or extensive cold ischemia time greater than 12 hours in a donor after brain death, or greater than eight hours in a DCD liver. If you get a call for a liver transplant and the surgeon tells you, this is the kind of liver I have for you, say no. And livers meeting these criteria were transplanted to patients without portal vein uh, thrombosis or significant cardiovascular morbidities, and it was for patients receiving their first transplant. I mean, you're actually testing this out take very complex transplants to do this in, so the patients didn't have portal vein thrombosis. And as you can see here, 200 and, I can't read that, 200 and, it was 185 or something livers offered, 59 were excluded, 95 livers were not included, and you can see they weren't included for very good reasons. And 31 of the livers included in the study um, were perfused, nine of them were not transplanted, and they transplanted 22 of them. So of the 33 livers that they actually perfused that met all the criteria, they used 71% of them. Now just remember, those 22 livers that got transplanted would have ended up in the garbage bin. That's 22 people that got a liver transplant because they were able to use this machine to tell whether or not the liver would work well. And so how did they do this? So the livers actually, when they brought them back, they hooked the patients, they hooked the livers up to the machine and they would perfuse the machine these four hours. And the reason why they do that is they found that from their previous studies that the ATP levels return to normal. At, you need at least four hours of perfusion to do that. And also they found that clearance of lactate actually maxes out at four hours in these livers when you use this machine. And so after uh, that particular period of time for four hours, patients who had lacked, the livers who had lactate levels less than two and a half, they were able to use those livers and transplant them into patients. Day outcomes and the 180 day outcomes, there was 100% graft survival, 32% early allograft dysfunction, 18% um, of patients needed renal replacement therapy, and the ICU stay was 3.5 days mean um, average, three, average uh, but 2 to 38 days was the spread. And the 180 day outcomes, 100% patient survival, 90% graft survival, and graft loss for non-astomotic strictures in DCD livers was significant to match controls. One of the problems we have with DCD livers, don't after cardiac death livers, is that the patients get ischemic cholangiopathy, which is a very bad complication to have. And what they found is that using the normal to make machine perfusion, when they did subgroup analysis, that patients who got DCD livers had a significantly lower rate of developing these strictures. And the graph there, what you show is actually um, <coughs> Compared to historical controls, what the six-month graph survival is, um, the top line actually is the cases and the bottom line is control. And as you can see, there's no significant difference between using these livers which have ended up in the garbage versus livers that were transplanted to people that were considered to be good livers. This is a huge thing, right? Um, if, if we estimate that they could actually recover 71% of the livers that actually are, um, that are actually able to be used, um, those without cancer and so on, that would actually go a, a long way into denting the number of patients we have on the liver transplant list and save a lot more lives. So NMP provides an objective assessment of high-risk organs and enables 71% of tested, currently unutilized livers to be transplanted without compromising patient safety. This is not available in the United States right now. Obviously, the FDA is gonna make them rerun all of these trials in order to use it. But um, you know, if we continue the way we are with the, with, um, <clears throat> the low um, number of organs we have available for patients, this is something that we would definitely have to look into. <laughs> now, the next thing that the, the, these authors looked at was trying to remove fat from the livers. Now, the reason why they do this is that historically, if you look at the panel, the far side of the um, screen there, if you look at livers of different degrees of fat in the liver, less than 5%, 5 to 35%, and greater than 35%, if you look at time to recovery of bilirubin after the transplant, it's much shorter for patients with lower levels of fat, and that increases for more fat in the liver. 
and that is also seen for ALT and to some degree for AST also. When, however, they look at the survival in the short term, there doesn't seem to be a real significant difference in terms of the outcomes. But <clears throat> surgeons will tell you that the risk of primary non-function and poor outcomes post-liver transplant is directly related to the use of um, highly steatotic livers. And in one more abstract that I'll show you soon, you'll see that fatty livers in a certain subgroup of patients does extremely poorly. Now, if we had a way of taking a liver that had 35% fat or 20% fat and making it into a liver with 5% fat, assuming everything else to be the same, we could use those organs and have very good outcomes. And so, you know, the whole concept of defatting a liver sounds very Star Trek, you know, and, and um, when people, I told people about this at the meeting, they said, so uh, can, can we drink whatever it is that they're giving these livers? And I know maybe I'll lose my fat too, but it's not, it's not that simple. <laughs> So the number two abstract at the meeting was pharmacological defatting of steatotic human donor livers during ex situ normal stomach machine perfusion. Now, they didn't put these livers into people. They were just testing to see if they could remove fat from the livers. So the aim was to assess the feasibility of defatting human donor livers during ex situ normal stomach machine perfusion and its effects on the metabolic functional recovery of the organs. And so what they did, they delivered a combination of defatting drugs yes, those exist, to discarded human donor livers during normal stomach machine perfusion. And this is what they did. They took 10 human liver donors discarded for transplantation due to a visual assessment of steatophis by the retrieval transplant surgeon. Now, if you've ever been out, you know, they made us go out to retrieve organs with the surgeons when I was a fellow. And you go out there and you might say, well, that's, that's a pretty subjective thing, you know, saying that the liver is fatty. It's actually not. Um, you look at that liver there, that yellow liver there, and the surgeons have this thing called the fingerprint test. You put your finger on the liver and you remove it. And if you still see your fingerprint there, the liver is too fatty. And that's, that's it's pretty, pretty good, actually. So these are very fatty livers. And then they brought the livers back in standard cold storage. And then they randomly allocated the experimental groups using something called covariate adaptive randomization method. And that's to take into account some of the livers might have been in cold ischemia for longer and, and that sort of thing. And so they brought the livers back, they rewarmed the livers for half an hour, and then they randomized them to regular normothermic perfusion. And then in the defatting group, they got normothermic perfusion, but they actually used, in, in the, instilled in the blood that was this cocktail that you can read more about in the Journal of Metabolic Engineering. And as you can see there, it's something called GW7 and so on that they use, and they perfuse the livers for 12 hours. And after the 12 hour period, what they looked at were certain parameters to assess how well the liver was working. So they looked at the flow and the resistance in the liver, and they can tell that from the machine. They looked at functional parameters like a lactate clearance, bile production. They can actually cannulate, they actually cannulate the bile duct of the liver, and they actually can, co can collect the bile and actually see how much bile is produced and so on. So a very functional assessment of the liver. Uh, glucose metabolism, pH, and they can actually assess uh, macrovesicular steatosis by biopsy. And they looked at production of ketone bodies and so on. And so what they found is that, so in the blue is the defatting group and the red one is the control group. So if you look at perfuse total ketone bodies and you want to have more ketone bodies, that's a good sign. Ketogenesis is a good sign. You can see in the group that actually got the defatting protocol, they produce more ketones. ATP synthesis, obviously, the more ATP you have in the liver, the the cells, and the ones that underwent the defatting protocol, ATP synthesis increased compared to the control group. And the control group, mind you, is getting the NMP perfusion. The only difference is that they're getting this defatting cocktail. Markers of reactive oxidant species and lipid peroxidation, and that's that 4-hydroxy neonyl. And actually, you can see you want that to be lower, and that's actually lower in the defatting group. And then they looked at markers of solubilization and exportation of lipids, which was actually superior in the defatting group. So what did this all result in in the end? If you look at the biopsy, times zero hours versus times six hours, you can actually see there's, by just eye visualization, visualization is a decrease in fat in the liver. And you might say, well, look, that's a sampling error. So what they did is they did multiple cores, and then they stained the cores, and they used pixel analysis. So basically, they're, they're using a computer to actually um, what percentage of that particular biopsy um, is positive for fat. 
And you can actually see that on the graphs on the side here. And they look at decrease in macrovesicular steatosis over six hours. That's the panel over here, but the one to the left. And actually, you can see blue is the defatting group. And red is the group that did not get, um, that had run standard NMP. And as you can see, over time, there's a gradual decrease in the amount of fat at 0, 6, 12 hours in the defatting group, while the red one, the standard NMP, there's no decrease in fat. And you can also see that in tissue triglycerides also. So there's a decrease in tissue triglycerides and fat with this protocol. So the conclusion is that pharmacological defatting of human livers is achievable within six hours and was associated with enhanced mitochondrial oxidative function, attenuated reperfusion injury, and successful recovery of the metabolic parameters or uh, the function of the organs. And so this is something they want to do is actually to try to defat these livers and put them into humans and see if they work. The same group actually did another study looking at a different type of protocol, a different, um, a different um, cocktail, mind you, um, to look at defatting, and they actually found that that was useful also, and that there was also a decrease in tissue triglycerides in that protocol. I just want to, I just want to show you that they're doing multiple, they're trying multiple approaches to do defatting of livers. <clears throat> now, I had talked before about why it is that using a non-fatty liver is, is, is better. And it is even more so accentuated when you look at this study here. And what this study did was looking at widespread obesity and the future of liver transplantation. Macrosteatotic liver allografts lead to significantly worse outcomes in obese recipients. So when uh, a liver is offered up to a patient, there's characteristics of the donor and liver and there's characteristics of the recipient. So the donor liver could actually be fatty or not, and the recipient could be obese or not obese. So there are four permutations and combinations you can get there, which I'll show you in a second. Um, and if you look here, uh, over here, what you can see is donor BMI at the time of donation. Over the years, if you look at the white, the, the clear white line, that's actually lean um, BMI donors. That's actually declined. And if you look at BMI 30 to 39, that's significantly increased, as well as BMI 25 to 29. So the livers that we're actually procuring from patients are actually from much more, uh, more obese patients. So what effect does this have on the, on the recipients? So they defined donor graft macrosteatosis, that is fat in the liver, as greater than 30% fat, and they call that a HSG, a high steatotic graft. And the recipient obesity was defined as high BMI greater than 35, and they adjusted this for ascites and so on. And so they studied the UNOS database, and at the end, um, by removing certain groups of patients and only looking at those that had donor biopsies where they could actually assess the amount of fat in the liver, they had 23,500 patients. And of those patients, as I said, there's four subgroups you can fall into. You can, be, uh, you can have a fatty liver in somebody with a high BMI, which is the red. You can have um, a, a non-fatty liver in somebody who is high BMI. You can have a fatty liver in somebody who's not high BMI, and then you can have somebody who's not getting a fatty liver and they're not overweight, right, which is green. So red potentially would be the worst group. You don't want to be in that. And green, that's why they color-coded like that. It's probably the best liver that you want to get. And when they looked at the characteristics of the people in this group, obviously patients, so in the high steatotic graph, high BMI group, um, the, the disease or... Um, or the, the biopsy of the livers, actually, they found that, um, not, not surprisingly, there was a high rate of NASH in, in those biopsies. And they also found um, that the recipient BMI was 38, because that's the high BMI group, as opposed to the low BMI group, which was 26.43. So this is the recipient. The recipient's BMI was 38 in the red group and 26.43 in the other group. And then they actually look at macrosteatosis. So the fatty livers have significantly more um, graft macrosteatosis, 39.3% versus like 5% in the low fatty liver groups. And what does this translate into? Um, and when they, when they did the outcomes and they looked at 30 and 90, uh, 30, 30 day survival, they found that two parameters independently predicted the survival of the liver and, at the, um, and the hazard ratio at one year for survival. And that was BMI greater than 35 and macrosteatosis greater than 30. So if you have both of these characteristics, potentially you should do worse. And when you look at the graphs for 30-day survival, 
60 day survival and one year survival, you can actually see red, which is the group that, got, that were overweight, that got a fatty liver, did significantly worse than patients who got a non-fatty liver who were not obese. And that's, that also is seen in 90 day survival and one year survival. So the problem is, is that a lot of our patients, NASH is a big issue now. And so if we could actually make, we can't, and you know, getting patients to lose weight is difficult, but if we could actually defat these livers, um, potentially we could actually nullify one of the um, really bad effects of having a fatty liver donated to you plus being overweight. And so that's why I think the previous study of defatting the livers actually will be uh, very beneficial. So in conclusions, what they found that graft steatosis 30% and recipient BMI greater than 35 are independent predictors of increased mortality after liver transplant. So actually Nora talked about this. Um, she kind of stole my thunder a little bit, but I just wanted to show you that um, the use of HCV positive livers, as you can see in the blue line, is actually increasing, right? And so not only for livers is this being done, as she alluded to, it's being done for lungs and it's also being done for hearts. And so she showed you this data already um, about using um, preemptive DAs in patients who actually are going for heart transplants. So I won't be, be go over that anymore. Last two things I want to talk about is something called frailty. Many times patients come to our, our, our attention and um, we ask these surgeons to go see them because we want to list them for liver transplant. They'll come back and say, he doesn't look good. And, and you know, that's, that's kind of very scientific. And so there is this concept of frailty where patients, you know, may not be able to walk well and so on. And many times when we get a referral for, for page from, from some of you guys, and, um, you know, we pick up the phone and I ask questions like, well, is the patient walking? Does he have the cubitus ulcers? Um, people kind of get upset on the phone with me sometimes, <laughs> but I ask these questions for a reason. Um, and that's because if they're frail, they don't do well. And I'll show you that in a minute. <coughs> So frailty is a construct developed in geriatrics as a state of decreased physiology. Frailty has been shown to be prevalent and predictive of weightless mortality in adults with cirrhosis of all ages awaiting liver transplant. The relationship between frailty, age, and weightless mortality has not been explored because there's this concept that as you get older, you get frail. Well, there are some 50-year-olds who are much more frail than 80-year-old patients who go for liver transplant. And the question is, is one, does one override the other? So um, Jennifer Lai and the group at UCSF and a group at uh, Hopkins has actually done a lot of very good work in this. And I think it's a very important area for us in liver transplant. And what they looked at was 886 adult liver transplant candidates who did not have liver cancer at both hospitals from 2012 to 2018. And the frailty test actually, I, I can't remember the three composites, parts of it, but one of it is balance. One is being able to stand from a chair and I forget what the third one is. But basically, you get scored, and then you fall into these categories of frail, pre-frail, and robust based on how you score on the test. And so they looked at candidates. Um, they defined candid older candidates as age greater than 65. And they looked at outcomes um, based on the components of the F LFI score. That's the frailty index score by candidate age, older versus younger. And then they compare that to weightless mortality. Now, as you can see here, when you look at younger versus older patients, and again, 65 is defined as older, um, but 20% of patients in the younger group were considered as frail, whereas about 35% in the older group were considered as frail. And as you can see, pre-fail, and, um, and in terms of robust, the younger patients, 18.4% were robust, whereas 4.5% in the older group were considered to be robust. <coughs> and when you look at the terms of mortality, and this is weightless mortality when they're waiting for a transplant, you can see the older frail patients actually fare the worst, with over 50% of them dying um, within three years of being on the list. This is followed by the younger frail group, then the older non-frail group, and the younger non-frail group. <coughs> I want to point out, though, that the younger non-frail group have a mortality of about 20% even on, um, after three years on the wait list, just to show you how, you know, how, um, how high the mortality is from end-stage liver disease. And when they did their uh, analysis looking for confounding factors, they found that both older age and frailty were associated with significantly higher risk of weightless mortality. 
However, the association between weightless mortality and frailty did not vary by candidate age. Frail older candidates had a higher risk mortality compared to non-frail older candidates, as well as frail younger candidates compared to non-frail younger candidates. So basically, frailty trumps age, but both of them are important. And so this concept of, well, I won't call this guy 75 years old, but the guy can do push-ups as opposed to a 50-year-old patient we have who's been bedbound for, for a month, uh, who has the cubitus ulcers, you know, I, I think, you know, um, the, these sort of studies will actually help us pick which patients I think will, be, will do better on the list. So the last thing I have five minutes is alcohol use after liver transplant and how to decide. I think the dogma here for most people in the room is when you call us, sometimes people will call me and say, you know, Dr. Lutchman, I know you're going to say no, um, but this guy drank last week and um, he's here, so I know the six-month mortality, the six-month wait list, so um, just tell me no so I can tell the family. So um, that, that kind of comes from looking at um, alcohol use after transplant. The reason why this six-month six thing has come into place is because people feel that if somebody doesn't drink for six months before they get listed for transplant, their likelihood of drinking after transplant is a lot lower. But <coughs> if you look at any alcohol use after liver transplant, and that was done from clinical interview with patients and family, and they actually tested the urine of the patients with ethyl glucuronide, which actually has a longer half-life than the standard blood test. About 33% of patients actually are drinking um, within three years after transplant. Now, this is historical data. So this is applying the six-month rule. So if 33% of the patients are drinking three years after a transplant, the six-month rule must not be that good. Um, so what, and, and they, they define drinking as two different things, non-sustained and sustained drinking. Now, you might say, okay, great, you know, um, people, people drink after liver transplant, the six-month rule is in place, and that's the dogma. But, of course, the French have to go mess it up for us. <clears throat> so I actually consider the work that these guys do is really spectacular. I don't know why it is that France has alcoholic liver disease. I've been there. I don't think they drink much more than Americans. But anyway, <laughs> these guys actually challenge the dogma that you had to wait six months. And they felt that patients who have acute alcoholic hepatitis with Madri scores more than 32, who have a very high mortality, could actually be transplanted in selected situations um, and have a low risk of, of drinking alcohol after uh, the transplant. And if you read the paper, over a two year period, they screened 800 and something patients and ended up transplanting 26 of them. So it's a very, very rigorous process. And the patients who get actually removed, it's a very high rate of removal. But the things that they were looking at is like, had the patient ever been to rehab and drank after they went to rehab? Have they ever been told that they have an uh, alcohol problem they continue to drink? Do they have family support? Do they have psychiatric issues and so on? And so when they weeded out all of these patients and they actually transplanted them, <coughs> they found survival um, compared to match controls, that is people who actually um, were of significant, of, of the same level of sickness and so on. When you look at the survival, um, after two years, it was 71% in the group that got transplanted and abysmal 23% in the group that didn't get transplanted. So if you didn't transplant these patients, about 75% of them were going to die. But when they looked at the outcomes in terms of drinking, it was actually quite low. And so this whole idea came about now, well, if we provide this rigorous net framework for people who have drank last week or yesterday or whatever the case may be, if, they f if we can identify the ones who had lower risk of drinking after the transplant, maybe we should be transplanting those patients. There's a lot of issues surrounding that in terms of being fair to patients and so on, but we won't get into that. But what these group, this group was looking at, <coughs> and this is from UCSF, who interestingly do not transplant patients unless they wait for six months. Um, we do at Stanford, interestingly. Um, but what they wanted to do is to, f if you could find a score, you know, scores are very in vogue now. If you have a scoring system that you could easily use to predict who's going to drink after a liver transplant, that would be very useful. And so they looked at liver transplant recipients. This is with clinical, clinician diagnosed alcoholic hepatitis, which are much greater than 32. They didn't require liver biopsy. No prior episodes of alcoholic hepatitis. No prior diagnosis of chronic liver disease. 
and they got a liver transplant at some centers without minimum period of abstinence. But every now and then, patients kind of go under the radar and they get transplanted before the six month period and they wanted to see what, what happened in these patients. And they use something called lasso, which is this technique that I don't really know too much about, but with it, you can actually come up with a scoring system um, to predict certain things. So from 12 centers, they got 129 patients who fit these criteria with a follow-up median of 1.6 years. And they had complete records of the alcohol use um, disorder <coughs> by an addiction specialist and a medical social worker. Because you can imagine, <coughs> at these 12 centers, if you're going to do this, if you're going to transplant somebody before, they would have seen psychiatry, these social workers have copious notes. They have very copious notes on these patients where they could actually collect this kind of data. The median age was 42, the vast majority were men and Caucasian were employed and 31% had psychiatric conditions. And as you can see, the um, mean Madri score was 78. So these guys were very sick. And that's probably why they got transplanted because they felt that their mortality was so high, they kind of um, didn't actually obey that six month rule. And the days listed before transplant, the average was six. And the mean was three to 11. And the days from the last drink, the mean was 54 days. So that's, by my math, that's like two months, not six months. And when they looked at history of failed rehab attempts, one prior attempt, 22%, and greater than two attempts, um, prior attempts, 18%. And then they looked at alcohol, uh, drug use, and so on. At the end of the day, what they found that the things that <coughs> predicted um, um, <coughs> alcohol use post-transplant was people who had more than two failed rehab attempts, who were drinking more than 10 drinks a day at presentation, legal issues, and history of um, non-THC illicit substance use. And then they came up with a scoring system, and the lasso actually up, uh, up gives these points. So for more than two failed attempts, you get four points. Greater than 10 drinks a day, you get four points, and so on. And then they came up with a scoring system, and they, they call it the SALT, Sustained Alcohol Use Post-Liver Transplant, the SALT score. And a low SALT score is zero to four, which has a 95% negative predictive value. So people who have this score, 95% of them um, don't use alcohol, have sustained alcohol use after liver transplant. As opposed to if your SALT score is more than it's five to 11, is a 25% positive predictive value. That is 25% of them will have sustained alcohol use after liver transplant, which also means that 75% of them with a high salt score don't continue to use alcohol. So it's not perfect. And then the area under the curve was 0.76. So how useful do I think this is? I think it's, 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 uh, it's nice um, that you, know, you could actually do something like this. But I'll tell you, when patients show up and you start hearing the story and all the family dynamics that are involved, I don't think that this score actually just takes all of those things into consideration. I think it's a useful tool maybe over the phone when we take phone calls from people um, to decide whether or not we're going to bring them in or not. But in terms of actually making a decision, a transplant selection of whether or not to transplant somebody or not, I think a lot more goes into it. Thank you. <laughs>